Good afternoon and welcome to MWW Talks. This is MWW Talks Consumers. I'm John Diggles, Executive Vice President and Midwest GM with MWW, and I am joined today by an award-winning consumer psychologist. Her name is Kit Yarrow. Kit, are you on with us? Hi, John. Hi, Kit. It's great to have you on. Uh, and to give everyone just this bit of history, um, I've known Kit for some time. Kit, you and I, of course, met uh, after with your book when I was doing research on millennials, and you know, I was found your book, Gen Buy. And uh, Kit's book, Gen Buy, is considered by many uh, to be really one of the standard-bearing early works on millennials as consumers. And Kit, it was terrific work, and your insights, I think, have been useful for a lot of marketers looking to connect with millennials. And now Kit has a new book. Uh, it's called Decoding the Consumer Mind. Uh, congratulations, Kit, on the book. Came out a couple Thanks, months John. ago, and uh, you're getting terrific reaction on it so far. Yeah, it's been very gratifying. I think it's uh, I think it's what marketers need to know about today: the psychology of consumers. Uh, so let's start there. And Kit, I am. Um, it's interesting as we've promoted this uh, this session and talked to people and put it on social. All of the reaction that we've gotten about the psychology of consumers, the shifts um, that you identify, and I want to go into those, but just looking at the last 10 years, economic recession, devastation, uh, people, you know, their paychecks going through significant erosion and then trying to rebuild those savings. Uh, millennials coming in as a consumer power, uh, powerful consumer base. And then of course you've had boomers who are all there as well and shifting into a new life stage. And then Gen Xers like me who are in the middle of it and still a powerful consumer base. But you talk about three specific shifts that affect everybody across generations I wonder if we can please start there. Oh yeah, absolutely. So the idea is that really, I don't think there's a harder job out there than to be a marketer today because you're flooded with all these new options, social and mobile and all that we can do with technology. And yet underneath that, I think the very fundamentals of consumer psychology have changed. And it's hard, I think, to put aside some of the tools that are wonderful that I think should be used to just kind of retrench and refocus on the motivations that consumers have to pick your brand over another one, to buy your product over another one. So I'm actually a clinical psychologist by training. So what I did was I went through and I found that there were really three huge sociocultural shifts that had created a, basically a new consumer psychology. We just have a different way, I think, of uh, relating to others. We have new ways of thinking. We have different emotions. I think psychologically, we're really different. And as every great marketer knows, that means we're going to buy things differently and want different things. Do you want me to go through each one of the three really briefly? Yeah, I'd like to start with that, Kit. You write about three, which I think are really powerful and really strong. And there, it, you know, some of them, it strikes people, oh, yeah, we expected that. But I think what's interesting is with some of your notes underneath them, you certainly write about technology, and mm -hmm. you certainly write about the sense of being more emotional. But what, I, what, what jumps to, I think, a lot of people um, is your sense of individual, individualism and even isolation that comes yes. from these shifts. Can you talk about those three and how they go together, please? Absolutely. So, you know, one of the ways that you and I connected was because we both love researching how technology has changed people and how to use technology in marketing. So maybe I'll save that one a little bit for later to go into in more detail because I actually have some questions for you about that one too. But just suffice it to say that when I look at the role of technology, it's not what we're doing with technology that I'm interested in. It's what technology is doing to us. And I have lots of different ways and lots of research to back it up on how we're cognitively, relationally, and emotionally different because of our intense use of technology. The second big shift, and I think the one that's been, you know, that you mentioned has been sort of surprising to people that have read the book, is that um, despite the fact that we have more Facebook friends than ever, we have more social media connections than ever, people feel more isolated than they ever have before. And there's a sense of detachment and loneliness in a lot of ways and kind of a move towards narcissism that really plays out in the marketplace. This is hugely important to marketers because I think it's one of the things that marketers can do to, to create a sense of connection with their consumers is to help them with these newfound feelings of um, isolation and more emotionality. 
So, for example, we used to um, have about three and a half friends per person research shows, and today we actually have under two, and I'm talking about real friends, friends that are there for you when times get rough. Um, and so people have lots and lots of superficial connections, but not a lot of nurturing and a sense of being seen um, in the general public. So that, that kind of sense of isolation has created also more emotionality. And there's lots of factors that have contributed to emotionality, but just, you know, a quick statistic to back that up, that three times more Americans report feeling anxious today than those that don't. And that's a really big shift from just 10 years ago. And there's lots of reasons for it. It's not just the economy. In general, we just have less trust in everybody, in government, in uh, businesses, in even religious institutions and schools. And so we've become a little bit more individualistic, kind of more all about me in a self-protective way. And that's created not just less collectivism as a society, but almost polarization. You know, today, instead of saying something like, I think your idea is stupid. We say, I think you're stupid. I mean, the level of rudeness and um, this type of discourse that we have, I think, again, increases anxiety and makes consumers feel ever more kind of on their own. It's, it's a fascinating uh, part on that, on that part, Kit, this sense of almost bullying each other's opinions. And it goes beyond politics, as you observe in your book. I mean, anyone, even, even if you go on different, different blogs or marketing discussions and you go down to the comments, there is that sense of attack. Yeah. It's sort of like where it's sort of like the ability to have real substantive debate often is often is sidelined by the sense of real personal attacks and those kinds of things. I mean, and and I see when you you do your speaking engagements, how do people? What do people? What kind of feedback do people give you on that on that trend? <laughs> Well, a lot of times one of the first things I'll ask when I get to that section of my typical presentation um, on the book is, does anybody feel like the world is a kinder, gentler place today than it was just six or seven years ago? And I can almost feel the relief in the audience that they're not alone in, in, in noticing that. I, it's, it's really universal in everyone that I talk to that they sense more of a sense of isolation, more of a sense of rudeness and rancor out there. And you know, psychologically, this is huge hugely threatening to us when we feel like we're not part of a group or a pack you know we're sort of pre-wired like think back to caveman days we're kind of pre-wired to take that seriously because although today we can live independently we're of the DNA of people who had to work in teams and groups and cooperatively in order to survive and so we get a real kind of visceral response to that and I think it's almost like road rage everywhere so this sense of invisibility that we have I think also allows people to be more impolite you know less respectful of other people's feelings less I think empathic of others Kit, um, the, the, term, the term consumer psychologist I think is fascinating <clears throat> to a lot of people and probably a lot of people following us on social. By the way, if you're following us on social, you can tweet us your questions, hashtag MWWTalksConsumers. Kit and I will look at those and address them as we go along. But Kit, the, the term, you know, the title of consumer psychologist that is so unique um, and obviously been your expertise and, and it goes into the how we shop why we shop and how we buy and the behaviors of consumers. But can you just help us for the audience and the viewers here take that deeper into what you do as a consumer psychologist and that expertise? Sure. So uh, my PhD is actually in clinical psychology and, and I initially worked as a therapist. And uh, you know, in the end I, I became a professor. Um, I love research. To me, assessment and research is really where my heart is. So um, I don't practice anymore. I'm not licensed anymore. I'm just a researcher, basically, and consultant and speaker and trying to apply clinical insights about human beings to the marketplace. To me, this is the ideal way of comparing generations, comparing times, because one thing that we have always done is shop. So always, I mean, if it was trading beads in the marketplace, we were still shopping. So it's a constant. And um, so how people shop differently, the sorts of things they want, you know, all this is really tied to our deep vote motivational needs. In a, in a marketplace today that's really flooded with options, one person's choice is going to be 
have more to do with their motivations to feel seen or to feel connected or to feel secure. These psychological and emotional motivations are more powerful than any practical motivations. And, you know, that's what happens with a lot of competition. And that's what I want to find out is what are those deeper motivations? What is it that gives one brand or a retailer a leg up over another? Kate, you talk about research and in your, for your book, you interviewed people, you and I talked, you interviewed marketers, you interviewed shoppers, you went on shop alongs, you looked at numerous studies, and you and I talked as you were writing your book. It seemed like you were making discoveries all the time, and theories that people had or that you heard in interviews or that you had proposed were getting knocked down and sort of reshaped right before your eyes. Can you tell us a bit about that process? Yeah, so exciting. So, uh, of course, I use other people's more academic research that gives me kind of a foundation that's based on, um, you know, really validated methods of looking at human behavior. And then um, adding to that my own primary research, which is usually qualitative, very much into ethnographies, going into people's houses, looking through their closets, going shopping with them. And I did a hundred of those. And then I think the part that was really exciting to me was talking to experts like you. And by the way, your quote, um, which is in the beginning of the book, I think it's on page 17 or 18, was I think the most popular quote of the whole book. I've had more people recite that back to me. Now let's see if I get it right. The problem with being cool is that someday you won't be. Right? Was that is that close? That's, that's, no, that's exactly it. That's exactly yeah. it. That was a that was a, a really interesting conversation you and I had about brands that sort of have that cool element. And, you know, look, as marketers, you have to accept that some of that stuff is given to you. You don't, you don't make that. Uh, you can't create that. People decide if you're cool or not. But sometimes what's cool, obviously, look, um, it isn't anymore. It passes on. Ask Fonzie and Pac-Man. Uh, you know, you might have your day later, but that's pretty retro. And I think for brands, as you and I were talking about, it's really dangerous because, you know, while some, um, a lot of times you see brands be really cool, they're owned by fans in a moment in time. You have a generation that at this life stage, you really fit for them. But once they're out of college, they might not touch you again. Um, and after that cool thing fades, what's your relevance to them? Um, and do they put you away with that time in their life that they've moved on? And it really does, it really does affect a lot of brands. And then you and I have talked about that sense and the quote finishes with reinvention how important that is. It's very difficult, but it is essential to keep yourself relevant beyond being cool. Exactly. And, you know, a big change, too, is that it used to be that a brand could be cool and last an entire generation's youth. And today, even, you know, within one generation's youth, a brand can go out of being cool pretty quickly, a new one, a new one. It's just happening faster and faster. So, um, you know, I think your insight about the problem with waning coolness, you know, what are, what are from your point of view, some of the things that businesses can do to reinvent themselves? Like, I know that you work with Walgreens and Samsung, which are kind of known for constantly reinventing. So what would you recommend to people to maintain that cool factor? You know, I think it's really about, um, again, if cool is given to you, it's about if you have this sense of dialogue and real relevance in their lives beyond those life stages. I think that's the tricky part with millennials is brands looking to connect with millennials. Millennials are everywhere from 18 to early 30s at this point. And you think about people in that life sense. What's really cool at 18 isn't cool anymore at 23. And certainly what's cool um, when you're in your mid-20s has changed dynamically in your early 30s. So I really think it's about cool comes from that sense of real connection and relevance yeah. with people. And if consumers are putting you into memories that have that sense of last, but you're finding new ways to cast yourself to new memories and new moments in time, I think cool comes with that sense of success. The fact that, look, this has always been something I have um, around me, and this is a brand that I really feel is part of my life. And that's pretty cool. Uh, and cool also comes in sales and profits and numbers like that. So that might be not, you know, shiny leather jacket cool, but it might be cool in the way that, hey, it's bottom line kind of cool. Not Fonzie cool, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, F Fonzie cool it depends. I guess if you're, in, if you're in the boardroom, that's pretty Fonzie cool too. Um, <laughs> and, and I, you know, I think that one of the things you and I talked about with that was this whole sense of um, 
what's cool uh, and how technology has has completely changed that. And you have this section in your book that really struck me and struck a lot of people that I've talked to about heritage as baggage that brands say, hey, we've been around for all this time. It doesn't matter as much anymore, right? If you're at this beautiful luxury, old luxury hotel that's hosted celebrities and world leaders for you know decades, but your Wi-Fi isn't very good, you're not so cool anymore. Um, and, and I just found it fascinating what you found that consumers really want the new, the heritage doesn't count as much anymore. Exactly. So yeah, that that particular quote from the book was very interesting to me that somebody who stayed at all the best hotels could really quickly pick out which ones were going to be losers based on how willing they were to upgrade to the technological requirements that most travelers have today. And that's the problem. A lot of great old heritage brands rest on their laurels. They can't believe that times have changed and that they need to change. And then you contrast that with some of the hotels that are changing. Like this, this person that I interviewed mentioned the Four Seasons in Toronto is a great example of a hotel that could be luxurious, but also up to date because everything was the latest sort of technology, which is what he felt was cool. And also a brand like Burberry who takes their heritage, but updates it and then also takes the time to explain why their products cost as much as they do. So they're creating a sense of transparency and trust by explaining the value and cost that goes into, you know, these uh, very expensive products. I found the, the same also with Hermes that, you know, an old heritage brand can be cool, but they have to do things to constantly remain relevant to um, consumers. So, you know, what people tell me is what every generation of cell phone that comes out, I get something better, I get something more. So even, you know, much older people that were at one time really un untrusting of innovation, you know, you have to really like search hard to find those early adopters and then hope that they tell somebody else. Today, that's kind of gone. It's really the other way around. People are not afraid of innovation. They look at innovation as the hallmark of brands that are working for them and really trying and, you know, upping the game. A website functionality comes up all the time as, you know, old brands, a lot of times they don't bother with really, really great websites. And um, that just marks you as, a pro, you know, one foot in the grave approaching death if you're not kind of keeping up with all the things that consumers sort of expect and need. Kit, we were talking about the emotional sense with consumers and that sense of emotion we were talking about, um, how that can be kind of even flammable early on. Um, we're seeing a lot of sort of this pushback on, you know, look, bloggers have become empowered and social uh, people on social have become empowered, but there's also responsibility with that about mm -hmm. not spreading misinformation or obviously you're pushing brands to act and some of them certainly do but there's a responsibility that comes back on consumers with that can you talk a bit about that and and not only what you have in your book but you've spoken to so many marketers since the book came out I, I'm wondering what you've gotten from those conversations on that element as well you know I can't say I have a super definitive answer on this yet I'm still really working hard and talking to marketers but here's what I've been saying so far there are dozens and dozens. Just last year, I think I counted something like 34 major brands that have had huge petitions filed against them um, by active consumers on social media. You read in any comment section of any review, ones that are obviously fake, ones that are written by competitors, ones that are just written by cranky people that you know, need to find a place to get their rocks off. And so, you know, what I'm kind of telling to mar marketers these days is that, you know, if you're not generating some sort of response, you're not out there enough. So the thing to do is to just overlook it, that I think consumers actually are getting really good at deciphering what's genuine feedback that I can use and what's irresponsible, nasty, inappropriate feedback um, or feedback that's just written by a competitor. I think consumers are actually getting much better at that. I don't think they get freaked out when they see the occasional negative review the way that they used to. They're less trusting as well and I think they obviously rely a great deal 
on uh, social media and feedback from other consumers to make decisions about which brands to approach. But I think they're also getting much more sophisticated about the weirdness out there. And so, again, it, you know, that was a hurdle, especially for a lot of older brands who their number one reason for not really getting involved in a conversation with their consumers was, you know, they were afraid somebody might say something mean. And you pretty much just have to get over that one. Exactly. <clears throat> That's the responsibility on both sides, right? It's like yeah. if you open yourself up on social, sure, you might not like all the comments on your page, but that's what dialogue is all about. Um, right. And I'm wondering if when you see with some of the some of the brands that maybe have resisted that, or even those that sort of need a refresh, are there any that jump to you right away or that you've seen in your research that, hey, people are rooting for you. It's time to it's time to get back in, into the game. Um, you know, I don't know that there's somebody that's hanging on the sidelines that people, you know, want to see get back in the game, but I think there's so many examples of brands that are doing it in, you know, such really remarkably refreshing and clever ways. But, you know, one of my current favorite examples after the Olympics was when I read a little study that said that the sixth most mentioned sponsor of the Olympics was Red Bull, who did not sponsor the Olympics. And I thought it's because of the way that they always are sponsoring great athletes, extreme sports. They don't do any outreach on this. They just nicely place a lot of media and YouTube videos for people to enjoy that um, always, you know, Felix Felix, while he's flying to the ground, there's the Red Bull logo on each shoulder. And so I think those kind of unconscious associations that people make with brands are more powerful than anything a brand has to say about themselves. And, and I think because we do process information so much more quickly today and on a slightly more superficial level, the power of symbols like just a logo that circumvents in a lot of ways the cognitive parts of our brain and goes right into emotional relevance is how people don't know that Red Bull didn't sponsor the Olympics but still feel really connected to that brand as representing um, sports and, 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 and great athletics. And we're seeing the same thing with World Cup, right? Like there's there's brands that aren't sponsoring World Cup. You know, you have brands that are just dominating it, like brands like Nike with um, – with their campaign connected to the World Cup with these episodic videos and risk everything and people are sharing them and commenting on them a lot and they've and they've really ingrained themselves in the tournament. Yeah. You know, search is used now more for news than traditional news outlets have ever ha, are at all. It, it's a first. We just crossed the line. Um, you know, for, for forever, I think we we looked at trusted sources of news. But even for something like World Cup, I think people are getting their news on that through social platforms and search much more than traditional media, which is, in their view, a lot of it is just too slow. You know, not personal enough. You can uh, just a reminder. You can tweet us your questions. Hashtag MWW Talks Consumers. Uh, Kit, we have someone on Twitter that has read your book, and they were talking about this sense of uh, this whole thing of thinking faster and people being speed yeah. demons. And we now watch a TV. Everybody, over 80% of people are watching it with second screens, with that tablet in front of them or their phone in front of them. Um, we're used to binge watching now on Netflix. We don't want to wait anymore. Don't play the season out. Give me everything right now. Yeah. We are entering into the two of the most important sales seasons of the year. We have back to school, which literally is just about upon us, believe it or not. And then we'll have the holiday season. And in your book, you write, it is essential that brands and marketers find a way to make a faster emotional connection. Yeah. Can we get a couple tips from you, from your yeah. research and discussions about how brands can do that in the next six months? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I think we have to know that seasons are out. So it's always back to school now and it's always holiday season. You know, obviously it ramps up during particular parts of the year. But I think rule number one is like our concept of when people shop for what is out the door. And logistics, I think, are the new, it's, it's, it's the new holy grail for marketers. You know, how can people get it when they want it, where they want it, at the moment that they have a desire for it. You know, that's really um, essential as, as people, I think, just look at time differently. They work around the clock. Um, you know, they, they shop around the clock. They want what they want when they want it. So that's kind of rule number one. But to me, 
I think maybe a missed opportunity for a lot of markers is to understand that people really don't want to take the time to read through, understand, listen. They're using sensory cues in a way that I think we've never seen them used before. So for example, what colors represent, you know, how a smell makes you change your behavior. These are the things that I think are good matches for our consumer that really doesn't take the time or have the patience or have the entrance or the tolerance of the ambiguity and the choice overload and all the anxiety that springs up with that to go through the mind. They want a direct hit to the heart. And I have a few studies in my book. People have found them super amusing. Um, I, I'll just give you a couple of my favorites. One is if you're eating a biscuit in a room that's lemon scented, you'll be tidier with the biscuit than if you're not smelling the lemons. Wow. And if you're eating in a restaurant with a lavender scent, you'll spend more money than if you're not, which didn't make any sense to me at all since lavender isn't a smell that I associate with good food, but it slows people down and causes them to order more. Colors, of course, have been studied a lot by marketers, but well, I was a waitress all the way through college and I wish I'd known then what I know now, which is that <laughs> waitresses wearing red get 16 to 24% higher tips. And if they slap on some red lipstick to go with it, boom, cha-ching. It's the, you know, it's the bi-color. Um, and so color in general, but also, you know, all the visuals that we process are more potent today than um, the words. And I think, you know, any, any, anything complicated, it has to be really quick, really emotional, very symbolic. And there's well, lots yeah, of other I'm, studies, smell, scent, touch, what you hear, music, all of these things to me are what I'd be looking into. And you can do this online as well. That's fascinating stuff, kid. I'll tell you what, I'm going to be wearing a red shirt and wearing lavender cologne on my next big new business pitch. Uh, <laughs> done, done deal. Yeah. Um, that's fascinating. I found that that section um, on symbol power really jumped to me as, you know, you kind of think about all of the stimulation you could put around people, but... You know, this whole sense of, look, um, even as, as they're checking out at the register, you, you have magazines and gum and candy there, and there used to be pretty good sales moving parts. They're all on their phones now. It's sort of like you have to surprise people because it's not always visual. Yes, yeah, Instagram and Pinterest have all picked up this sense of, you know, of progress and, and momentum, but you really do have to surprise people to connect with them now. No, that's... A hugely important point too, just to break through and get a few moments of attention. You know, I think one of the things marketers have really relied on to break through and get attention and inspire action has been the bargain. And the bargain works because it's permission to buy right now, it's a reason why you have to, but you know what, it's really a symbol, it's not the bargain, it's not really about the money, this is what I hear from consumers, okay yes in a lot of ways it is about the money, but instead it's what you're talking about, it's the breakthrough, it's in a world of stuff, there's so much to look at, there's so much to choose from, choice creates anxiety in people, they worry will they make a mistake, and so the bargain is the way for the person to feel reassured, they're not being taken advantage of by a business they don't trust, they're not going to make a mistake and get something they don't need, but there's other ways to communicate that need to buy now, um, you know, it could be a charity tie-in, it could be only available in this particular location, it could be inspired by a great consumer interaction with a, an employee. There's other ways, but, but you're right. You have to break through in some ways. And I think uh, there's lots of ways to do that without it being bargain oriented. Get two more quick questions as we, okay. as we wrap up our session here. And again, just a reminder, you can tweet us your questions, MWW Talks Consumers. Kit and I will be on after the session. We'll be watching Twitter and can answer them beyond this. But one of the other tweets that we got, Kit, was somebody read your article in Time Magazine, what you wrote, and it's a really, it's a funny, it's also a spooky piece about how consumers have really started to buy into and really have done this a lot, buy into outlandish marketing campaigns and outlandish marketing claims. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us like what that piece and like why you think people fall for that now? You know, first and foremost, we do it because 
we have this great, wonderful human quality of hopefulness. So first and foremost, I just have to say for all who have fallen, um, that you know it's because you hope. It's because you're optimistic, and I think that's a very American, in particular, quality to think. You know, yeah, it can work, but it works better today because of this belief in innovation that we have. Part of it because we've seen like wizardry like never before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kit, my last uh, my last question is: um, Look, World Cup has been this major tournament. It's wrapping up this Sunday. We've seen yeah. brands spending millions and really getting involved in it. And, you know, have you observed things from there? I mean, people are tweeting it. The Germany-Brazil game was the most tweeted sports event ever, even more than the Super Bowl, like 10 million tweets more than the Super Bowl. Any observations from that? Yeah, well, I, I think it really marks this great desire that we have to belong to things, to, be to belong to big events, to belong to each other, to feel part of a community, to feel part of something, to root together. You know, if you walked around the streets, even yesterday, um, you know, you saw groups of people that didn't know each other banding together. It's the wonderful thing about sports. And who's going to win, by the way, John? Who's, the, who are you, who's your pick? <laughs> you know, I, I, it's been an exciting tournament. It's really been an anything-can-happen tournament. We're down to – we have Germany, who, which had a terrific, amazing game against Brazil the other day, and now we have Argentina. I picked Argentina at the beginning of the tournament. I'm staying with it. Wow. That was prescient. Good. For, I'm not surprised, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kit, I want to thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, it's been great having you on. Uh, and I want to, again, congratulate you on the book. The book is called Decoding the Consumer Mind. I think it's a must-read for marketers. It hits, it hits marketing and connecting with consumers from a completely different angle. It's really powerful stuff, Kit, and congratulations on the book. You can buy it on Amazon. There's a hardcover edition uh, and, of course, the Kindle edition. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, thanks again, Kit Yarrow, and uh, for joining us. Hashtag again is MWW Talks Consumers. Kit's, uh, Kit's email, his Twitter handle is at Jen Bai. Uh, and I, Jen Bai is a great book as well. So, Kit, thanks again. My pleasure.